Hello and welcome to episode 1 of our tutorial series where we will be building a DirectX ready game engine. This series will focus mainly on the Win32 and DirectX 12 platforms although throughout our journey we will also be adding a few other features to both broaden the capabilities of our game engine and to also broaden our own skill sets as well. In this episode we will be creating our folder structures, setting up our blank project and writing the code for our first window. At the end of this episode we will have our first working program to show. So without further ado, let's get into it. The first thing that we need to consider when creating our game engine is where we're going to locate it. And it's a good idea at this stage to try and stay as organized as possible. Later when we have a larger project to work with, there will be lots of independent files in which we need to keep track of such as image files or sound files and models and it's a good idea to have these in one centralized location. For this reason I've gone ahead and created us a new folder and I've called this Olympus Mons. I've located this directly on my main drive and this helps to give us as short and easy to remember a URL as possible. Sometimes in the scripts we actually need to write this in so it's nice to keep it short and easy to remember. Inside this folder I've started to put us a few things just to get us started with. I put in here a little icon file which is actually powering this folder. It was a PNG that I used a PNG to icon converter online. It adds a little bit of spice and it's really easy to do so I suggest you make your own. I've also added us an e a folder for this episode. We'll put all of our scripts from today's episode into this folder and each new week there will be a new one to work with. The only other two things in this folder are the license and the readme files supplied by GitHub. That's because this folder will be available on GitHub. If you'd like to follow along with the code, please download the code from GitHub in the description below. That being said, let's move on. To create a new project, we'll need to open up a new copy of Visual Studio 2019 and click on Create a New Project. Microsoft provides us with lots of great project templates to start with but because we want to learn and because we want to do this from the very beginning we're going to click on empty project and next. Visual Studio will then ask us for three things the project name, the location in which we would like to save it and the name for our solution. You may be able to see in our location that this is already set to episode 1 folder that we created earlier. For our solution name, I'm going to choose the Olympus engine. You can call your engine whatever you like, but for this tutorial series we're going to call it the Olympus engine. For our project name, I'm just going to choose blank project. At the beginning we're going to be focusing mainly on setting up our game engine and less on any specific projects that we want to work for. So for now, blank project will do us fine. With that all set, we can hit create and move on. Now that Visual Studio is opened and our project has been created, it's time to go in and change a few things that I think help me stay organized. The first thing I like to do is just change the names of these folders. The header files will actually be where we're keeping all of our public files and for this reason I'm going to change this to public. Under the same logic, the source files is where we're going to be keeping all of our private files, so I'm going to change this to private. These two folders are actually set up with scripts in the background that put all of our scripts in these folders, so it's a good idea to change these and not to recreate them. Once this is done I like to click on add, new filter and just add us a source folder to put these two folders in. This will help us to know that all of our scripts go in these two folders. To match the only thing I like to do is change resource files to resources. There's no specific logic to this other than the fact that I want it to match. Once this is done we can come up here, click on switch views and go to our folder view. This is a representation of what our directory looks like on our hard drive. I like to then click on blank project, click add, new folder and change this to source. This will be so that we have one folder to keep all of our scripts in on our directory as well. Again later we may have image files and different folders that we want to keep in here so it helps to stay organized early on. 
To set up our project, we're going to need one file in here. So I'm going to click Add, New File, and to call this Win Main. This is going to save as the entry point of our program. I'm not going to add anything to WinMain at the moment, but it just needs to be there to set up our configurations. Once this is done, we can click back on Switch Views and go back to our Project View. This is all set up so that we can move forward, and it's in a much more organised way. Now that our project is looking a little bit nicer, it's time to set up some of our configurations. So if we right click on blank project, we can go to properties. And this will bring up our property pages. The first thing I like to do is just come up to configuration manager and we're actually going to remove the x86 architecture. A lot of the platforms, for example, DirectX 12 is going to need the 64-bit architecture and this means we're not going to need to actually set up the 32 bits. So it's easier just to remove it now. To do this, click on Edit, click on X86 and go to Remove. Make sure to remove that as so and close that down. There's actually a second one in here that we need to remove as well. So if we go to Platform, Win32, we can go Edit, click on the Win32 and hit Remove. With that done, we can close out of there. And you'll notice in here we will no longer have the platform options. We're always going to be building in X64. The next thing to set up would be our output directory. And you can see in here we've got platform. That is actually irrelevant now because we've just removed that. So to start with, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to replace that with project name. That means if we put more projects in here later, they'll all build in their own folder. And that's handy. Put that in there and let's click on here. The next thing I want to do is make sure that all of our build files go in their own folder. And there's a couple of different ways of doing this. The generally accepted way of doing this is to create a bin and an object folder. But I like to be quite direct in the way I do this, so I'm going to create a build and intermediate folder. And this just helps me to stay organized. As I say, you can have it however you like, but I prefer build and an intermediate folder over a bin and an object folder. Now that our output directory is looking good, I want to just copy and paste that and we're going to put that straight into our intermediate directory. I'm going to change build for intermediate. And the only thing that I actually want to change here is just take this project name and I want to be able to put this before intermediate. Our build files will all go in the same folder, but I want all of our intermediate folders to go in their own project folder, so it's good to just swap those around. Now that we've done that, we can just try and make sure that our project is set to the maximum version available for our system. So if we come to Windows SDK, this is already set to latest installed version, and of my time this is going to be this one here, so I'm just going to click there. That just means that we're going to be definitely using that. If we come down to here, we can also just make sure that but this one and this one are set to the latest version available. At this time of recording is going to be the C++ 17 standards. There are multiple other things that we can do in these property pages to set it up and make it streamlined for us. And we will be coming back to this throughout this series. But at the moment, this is roughly all that we need to do apart from one last thing. If we come down to linker, we can come down to system and we'll see the subsystem here is currently set to console. Now this would be great if we wanted a console box to come up and print it, but we're making a graphics program. So we want a graphics window to be able to appear. So for this, we're going to change this from console to window. And as I say, when we run this later, this will now appear a window. This is the only thing I want to set up for now in our property pages. So if we click apply and OK, that will be everything that we need to set up and we can move on to actually our starting to write our code. Now that we've finished setting up our project configurations, it's time to get into the nitty gritty of starting to write some code. And the first thing that we're going to need is our entry function. We added our winmain.cpp file to our folder directory earlier, but we yet to have added it to our solution. And for this reason, I'm going to go up to private, right click and hit add existing item, go to our source folder that we created earlier, 
and click on winmain.cpp. This will add it to our solution directory. Now that's done, we can add our entry function. Each program that we create is going to look for a specific function to operate as our entry function. And this is the specific function that our program is looking for. It's an integer based function and it's called winmain. As such, we need to return an integer at the end. To make this operate correctly, we need to include the windows.h header file at the top. The winmain function asks us for four inputs. Now we don't need to specifically put these in, this will happen automatically. However, we can take the information out from here. The first input is the h instance class and this is basically a representation of the entire program that is running. The second input is a much older function that really doesn't have much use now. It was for when you needed to run in the previous instance of a program in order to change the functionality and it doesn't actually operate correctly on Windows 10 or onwards now. We can actually just remove this straight from here. The third input is the command line input and this gives us the ability to put different commands in at one time to actually change the functionality of our program later. That's useful, we might use that. The fourth and last input is the command show input. And what this is, is this is the command that we want to use on whether we want to show the window at the beginning or not. In general, we'll just say yes, please show the window. Now we've added this function, this is a fully working program on its own. And we can go up here and hit the green button to actually run this program. It will compile quickly and then it will flash orange. That means it's working without problems. At the end of this episode, we want to have our first window displayed on the screen. And to do this, we're going to need to follow three simple steps. These steps are as follows. First, we'll need to create a Windows class and give it certain details such as its name and its sizes. Next, we'll need to use that class to actually create our window and to display it onto the screen. And thirdly, we'll need to create a message listener in which we can accept messages that could change the overall features of our window. To get started, we're going to need a new class, and that is going to start as a WND class EX. You can also use WND class, it works very slightly different, but it doesn't come with as many features. For that reason, we're going to skip straight to the WND class EX and get, make benefit of all of the great features that come with it. There are a lot of variables that need to be put into this, into this class to actually make it work correctly. There are also four that I like to just put up at the top here because it's very unlikely we're ever going to change these no matter how many times we create them. The first variable here basically says the size of our class and we just feed back in the size of itself. It's very simple, this is like initializing itself. The second says that on our style we want a horizontal redraw and a vertical redraw. This will be the same for every program we make. The next two variables are actually to add extra memory at runtime for our program. This won't be needed for us because we can draw as much memory as we like later and therefore we don't need to feed in anything new now. The next thing that we need to add are a few things that we could change but I don't think we will ever change for this entire tutorial series. This is the cursor and the background color. The cursor is currently set to the basic default cursor that you would see normally and the background is currently set to a null brush that will be white. A lot of people do like to actually change the color of the uh, background but once we initialize DirectX 12 this is going to do it for us so this is not actually needed right now. The next thing that we're going to add is something that we will be changing during this tutorial series and that is the icon. We won't be changing it in this episode, but we will come back to this later. At the moment, we're just feeding in the IDI application, and this is the basic default icon for all applications. 
There's two of them because there's two icons that we need. One comes from the window itself in the top left hand corner and the other one actually appears on the icon taskbar itself. For that reason we need two. The next thing we need to do is create a class name, a name for our class. Now we could put this in here directly but that would be bad form. What we should actually do is create an actual variable for our class name so that we can use it multiple times in the future. What we're going to do is we're going to come up here outside of WinMain and just drop in a W character. That is a wide character, it's very similar to a basic character but it's slightly longer. This is currently set to an array of a window class and it's got 256 different possible characters that we could put in. Again, if we're being 100% correct, we should not have this 256 number in here, mainly because it doesn't explain why or how we're using it, and that is bad form. If someone else was trying to read our code, someone might say, what does this number represent, and we have no way of showing it. So what I'd like to do is just create a definition or a macro for what this means. I've set this to max name string, and it's set to 256 this reason we can just put this in here and now everyone knows that the maximum string size of a name for a class is going to be 256 and everyone can understand this a lot clearer. With that done we can now use our window class to initialize our... this actually has put across as the menu name this should be the class name here so I'm just going to change that around there and we'll set up our menu in a moment. There we go, that's done. Now that's set, set correctly to class name, we can put this in here. But you may have noticed we haven't actually initialized this at all. We haven't said what we want our class name to be. So if we come up inside WinMain this time, at the very beginning, we can put up a section in here which should be initialize global variables. Perfect. Change that to a Z. We can then actually initialize our window class with what we would like it to be. And to do this, we're going to use a WCS copy, which is for use in W characters. We're going to input the window class variable in here, and we're just going to use a text variable to add tutorial one class to the name. We can save that off, and that is now set and can be used in here. A moment ago you may have seen me adding in by accident the menu. On all windows you will find menus such as this up here. On some windows we may want this but specifically for a game window this is not normally included. So to set up our menu I'm just going to null pointer it at the moment. There's lots of documentation on how you can set up a menu online but we're not going to be doing it for this series. The next thing that we need to add is a reference to the instance of our program that's running. And you may remember earlier, this is the variable that we're looking for. This is an instance of the entire program running. We can very easily now put this in here, and put this in here, and this will work. But this may not be the only program or the only function that is looking for this variable. If we create multiple classes later, and we need to use this variable in those classes, using this methodology means we would need to pass this variable into each new class and that could be a rather annoying thing to do having to keep on passing reference upon reference. So there's actually a quick and easy way to do that. We can actually get rid of this completely and just for reference we can actually do that with all of these. Every single one of these inputs has its own command that we can use to draw this in later. So we won't need these up at all and we can just put the actual variable types in. Now, how do we get back our H instance from earlier? There's a specific program or a specific function that I like to actually add and that is the get module handle. We can just throw this up here and I put it as a, a definition. The get module handle function will actually call back our H instance as if we were just drawing it from here, which means we can use this in any class or function that we want without having to pass it in first. It's much easier, so let's just use this. 
as I said a moment ago, we're going to find that there is one of those for each of these. So keep watching and I'll like add them in. The last thing that we need to add on here is the instructions for how our window is going to perform. Later and in episode two, we'll be able to redefine this to include specific commands to make the window change size or close or shut the program when we close it. We'll need to define that all later, but for this episode, we can get away with just using the default Windows process. This means it will come with a couple of basic things already set up and we don't actually need to define it right now. That's handy for us to just keep this video as short as possible. Once we have set up all of the individual variables for this class, there's only one thing left to do and actually to register this class. There are two functions, one is register class and the other one is register class EX. We are obviously using a Windows class EX, so we need to use the register class EX function. We just pass in our Windows class into there and that will register our class. That's everything we need and our class is set up. Now that we've finished setting up the definitions for our class, we can move on to creating and displaying our window. To do this, we're going to use the create window command. Create window function will return a window handle, and this is basically a representation of the entire window. There are a few different inputs that we need to run to actually create our window. Some of them we have and some of them we don't. The window class is what we created a moment ago, so we won't need to recreate that now. The next input is the window title. This is the title of the window that will appear at the very top. We haven't created that yet, so let's move on now. We can do this exactly the same as our window class, and we can just create another W character. We can just copy and paste this here and change the name to window title. As we've created a new variable, we'll also need to initialize it. So once again, we can just copy and paste what we've done for Windows class and change the details. Let's change the name to Windows title. And let's change the text here to our first window. Now that that's all set up, we can move on. The third variable here is going to be the window style. I'm not going to go into any detail about all the different things that we can do with window styles, but there's lots that you can, so I suggest you look into it. The next two variables here are the X and Y position for the location of the window. We're not going to change this at the moment because the CW use default command will actually give us the default windows location for a new window. The next two variables are the width and the height we want the window at. This we do not have yet, so we need to create this now. Let's come up to our global variables and let's just create two integer variables, one called windows height and one called windows width. Just the same as we did with our strings, as we've created new variables, we're going to need to initialize that. I'm going to choose a width of 1366 and a height of 768. This is kind of a win standard window size and it should operate on most screens, so it's a nice simple window size to start with. Now that we've finished that, that you'll notice that the error message that we had has now gone away and this should operate perfectly. But let's just finish this off for now. The next input here is going to be the parent window. For example, we wanted to create a window which was an error box, created by another window. The first window would be the parent, and the error box would be the child. And in this area here, we could feed in the details of the parent. There is no parent for this window, so we're just going to use this as a null pointer. The next variable here is for the menu. 
I've already explained that we're not going to be covering menus in a game engine, so we can leave this as null pointer. The next variable here is the h instance, and this is using the macro that we created earlier. Sometimes we could have used this, but now we have our special macro, we don't ever need to use this or pass this information along, we can always just use h instance. The last variable here, although it's a null pointer, is very important. This variable means we're going to be able to give specific instructions to our window at runtime to do some special things. We're going to be covering this a lot later, so I won't go into this now, but just remember this one, this one's going to be important later. That's everything we need to actually create our window. The next thing we're going to need to do is actually to show it. To do this we're going to use the show window function and this is just going to use the handle for our window that we created a moment ago. The other variable here is SWSHOW and this means please show the window. You may remember earlier that we had a variable here called the N command show and this was how we wanted our window to show up at the beginning. As standard SW show is what that variable would have been so we didn't need to pass it across we can just declare it straight yes we want to show our window using the SW show command. This is everything that we would need to be able to create and display our window now. There is one other possibility that we need to think about when building our code however. It is possible that while we're creating this window there could be an error and the window could not create. We're then asking directly afterwards to show a window that might not have created and if it hadn't this program would then crash. So we need a way to know whether this create window function has been successful. And to be able to do that, all we're going to do is ask if the window has been created, and if it hasn't, we're going to shut down immediately. Let's do this as such. We're going to say, if there is no window handle being created, we're just going to return zero. And this will nicely shut down the, the window. There is many possible reasons however why a window might shut down and we probably want a slightly better communication method to say why our window has shut down. Later we'll be working on loggers and error messages but for right now let's just use a really simple way of actually doing this and that is a very simple command that window gives us called message box. I won't go into all of the details of message box, but if you copy this as such, you should get the desired effects. This basically now says, if we don't have a window, let's use a message box to pop up, fail to create window, and then to shut down. This is everything we need while creating our window. That's everything we need and our window is now fully set up. But if we were to run this right now, you would see that our screen would flash orange as if the program was running, but it would immediately exit out. And this is because we've set no specific way for our program to continue running. To do this, we're going to need to create some form of looping function and we'll do this with our message listener. The message listener is a little bit more complicated so I'm going to copy and paste the whole thing in and then we'll go through it. What this does is this creates a message class. This is a message event and it will give individual commands to our system. I've just initialized this with a zero just to make sure that this is ready to go. I've also added in a while loop here and we use our while loop with the message that we've just created and we'll say why our message is not equal to the quick command please continue. 
Once we've used our while message, we can actually create a peak message. There are a few different ways to do this, and this is a slightly more advanced way to do it. However, because we want to ensure that our program is the most efficient possible, we're going to jump straight into using this peak message command. This is a non-blocking command, so we can run this, check to see if there's a message, and if there isn't a message, we can continue and run other code. This will be handy for our game engine, because this means that we can run other aspects of the game engine while not being caught just on Windows messages. The next two commands here just basically translate and send the message to the window that's involved. With that all done, we can come up to our green button and hit play, and we'll see our very first window appearing on the screen. Just bring that over for us. There's our window. Now that we've done all of that, we have our very first window and our very first C++ program ready to use. In later episodes, we're going to use the DirectX 12 API to create graphics in a graphics engine to show directly on the screen. For this reason, this window needs to be set up and ready to use in the best way possible. The next episode will focus directly on how we can make this window run as efficiently as possible. With that being said, that's everything from this tutorial, so I would like to wish you the best of luck, and I'll see you in the next one, where we'll be creating a C++ DirectX 12 game engine.